We can all benefit from having faster running queries. If you're a business analyst, that may mean having your dashboards and your analytical queries run faster. If you're a data scientist, maybe your EDA as well as your data pre-processing pipelines finish faster. Or for a software engineer, it just means reducing the latency of your application. Whatever it is, faster queries are always going to help us. In this video, I'm going to dive into some of the ways that you can optimize your query performance. We're going to look at the queries themselves. We're going to look at the data models, but also some things like the actual database that you're going to be using and optimizations that you should think about there. So let's start at the top or rather at the bottom. We're going to start with the storage layer and we're going to start off talking about relational database management systems. So for example, Postgres or MySQL. If you have your queries running on there, if you have your application backed by an RDBMS, then your layout there, your data layout is gonna be very different from what you have, for example, in a data warehouse, which we'll talk about later. So one of the first biggest things that you should always think about with an RDBMS is what indexes are you using? And this really is heavily dependent on your queries themselves. What filters are you doing often? What groupings are you doing often? Because based on those things, you're gonna to wanna to have indices because that's gonna speed up the performance of your queries a lot. If you're filtering on three columns, but you only have an index on one of those columns, then you're gonna do an index scan first, but the other two are just gonna be table scans on those components. But if you actually have indices on the combination of the three, you're able to do a very efficient index lookup immediately. That being said, having too many indices will actually cause database bloat because your database needs to maintain all of these indices and it can actually cause your whole application to slow down in the background just because of the constant churning of index updating that the database has to do. So keep in mind, have indices for the queries that you actually need to run for the filters that you're actually using but don't keep unnecessary indices if you're not using them because that's actually only gonna hurt your performance long time. Now the way that you're gonna approach the layout in a data warehouse is very different from the RDBMS that we just talked about. In a data warehouse, your data isn't necessarily gonna be stored on disk like we have in that traditional database. Instead, we're gonna have large amounts of files in some more scalable storage medium. And so the way that you're gonna be thinking about your data layout here is gonna be very different. Generally, in a data warehouse, the concept of indices doesn't necessarily exist. Instead, you're gonna be thinking more about concepts like clustering and partitions. And essentially what you're trying to do here is you wanna come up with a strategy where the data that's accessed often together is very close in space. So generally that would mean partitioning by certain columns that you're gonna be using often. For example, a very common thing to partition for is gonna be the date, be it the date that the data was ingested in or the date that these events are represented for. But either way, having all of that data closer together, which means ideally in the same file or very close together there, is gonna make your queries a lot faster because you're gonna to have to open less files and you're gonna to have to scan through less of those. And so really there, clustering and partitioning is gonna help by just bringing data closer together, which means you're gonna to have to do less reading and searching operations. In addition to that, it's also important to keep in mind that just doing a select star may actually be detrimental to you, especially if you don't actually need all of the columns. And now the reason for this is, is that data in a data warehouse is very often stored in a columnar format, which means one column is stored sequentially, and then you'll have the next column. So if you're selecting just a single column, then essentially you're just selecting a continuous chunk of data. But if you wanna select multiple columns, then you have to select more and more components. Whereas in a disk, based database, essentially you're more likely to have rows grouped together. And so in that case, it's not gonna affect it as much, although it's still an important thing to keep in mind to not really get data that you don't need. But really this performance benefit is gonna be much more obvious in a data warehouse where there really is physical separation of that data and it's gonna speed it up a lot if you do a select column A and column B versus just a select star, especially if the number of columns that you have in your data warehouse starts to grow a lot because you just need to search for less data. It's all located in the same place and it goes much quicker to retrieve it. The next place where you'll likely encounter problems is going to be the way that you set up your data models. So for example, maybe you've included a JSON or a blob or a JSONB type data type in your data model, but you're actually doing search queries on that component. 
that's really going to be detrimental to your performance because searching through these blob like fields is actually much more difficult and really takes a lot more processing time. And so if you find yourself very often searching for the same things in these JSON type structures, you should instead think to modify your data model. Can you take out this information and put it into a separate column so that you can more properly treat it as a separate entity, which also makes it a lot easier to search because you don't need to search through unstructured data, but rather have a well-defined data layout. And now this very often kind of happens over time where you start off with a data model and maybe you have some sort of metadata column defined where you're not sure exactly all of the things that are going to be in there because, you know, the project is new and you're trying to adapt and evolve quickly and you just kind of want to have a space for metadata. But then you find out that there's a component that you very, very often access. So what you can do over time is modify your data model, take that out and make it a separate column. And then you're just going to be able to speed up your performance because for one, you can index it if you want to, but also just not having to search through this JSON structured data is already going to be amazing for your performance too. The next thing that you're going to want to think about is the degree of normalization that you use in your database. Now, very often when you start off studying things like SQL, you're going to learn about star schema, you're going to learn about snowflake schema, maybe 3NF, and you're going to think about how much can I normalize my data. Now, this can be a very good thing if you have a lot of inserts, because it essentially means you have to store less data, and it's much easier to just insert it if everything is normalized, because it kind of goes into its own component, and it just makes those components more efficient, and it also is more space efficient. But if you're running analytical queries, then what that means is you're going to have to do a lot of joins. Now, depending on how big your tables are, you may not be able to do something like a hash join anymore where things are actually stored and joined in memory, but instead you're actually going to need to use a disk component, which is going to slow things down a lot because then there are also going to be other operations like sorting involved with that. And so really think about the degree of normalization that you're using and if it's actually necessary and think about the common queries that you're writing. If you often find yourself joining two tables just because you need one thing together and there's really no benefit from having these components separate, maybe what you can do is just add an extra column into that base table that you have into your main fact table where you have that column repeated. And then you can just skip the join and obviously you're gonna have some repeated data there which you can get from the join. But in the modern world, storage and CPU is quite cheap. And so if you're going to pay an extra maybe 50 or 100 bucks for something that is going to massively increase the performance of your queries, you know, obviously that's a benefit because overall you're going to be paying extra in terms of computing resources, as well as also just the time it takes for these things to complete. So always think about these different trade-offs and really also think about the practical implications that these changes are going to have on the actual size of your data. Obviously, you don't want to bring everything together in the same table because you're going to be storing a lot of repeated fields that can be taken out. But always think about the context that you're working in. And can I maybe denormalize the information that I have a little bit so that I have to do less computationally intensive work by doing more complex joins, but instead have all of that data available in the same place, which can actually then benefit performance, which can sometimes even push down costs. Obviously, this is a very situational thing, and you need to think about the different trade-offs that you have, but always consider this as an option that going into heavy normalization may not always be the right approach. Another thing that you should keep in mind is using materialized views. You may find your queries rerunning the same things over and over and over again, but the base table is actually rarely changing. For example, if you have a query that runs maybe hourly or even daily, but maybe 90 to 95% of your data hasn't changed, right? If you're scanning through a long range of historical data and then it's one new day, that proportion of that one day to maybe the last six months of the last year is gonna be relatively small. And there aren't going to be that many changes depending on you know how you slice and dice your data so in this case thinking about materialized views can be a really beneficial thing where you essentially bring forth into a separate table the results of your base query and so rather than having to recompute everything over and over and over again you compute it once you store it in a separate table and now you can query that table and you can do your operations on there. And that's just going to take out a lot of that heavy lifting, especially if your base fact table becomes very, very large because you don't need to do the same work over and over and over again.
Now that being said, materialized views can actually also can be a detriment sometimes, especially if the data in your table is updating at a very, very fast pace, because materialized views are gonna try to update themselves every time new data arrives. So if data is constantly arriving at a very, very, very fast pace, you're gonna be spending a lot of money for this background work to be done for the materialized view to keep itself up to date. And if you're not using the materialized view as often, then it's actually gonna be less cost efficient for you. So there's definitely things to think about here, but if you find yourself doing the same work over and over and over again, then you know think about a materialized view. But if you're not really having that many problems with it and your data is changing frequently and your view would need to be updated all the time, then obviously there can be a cost detriment there too. And kind of in between step that you can take here is actually creating a temporary table where you have several queries that require the same kind of base process data. And rather than reprocessing it every single time for each of these queries, you created once, you run each of your queries on this temporary table, and at the end of your whole job, you drop that temporary table again. And so there again, you're able to essentially remove repeated work and only do it once, reuse those results, and then at the end you can discard it so that next run you can redo that big one once and then again just kind of use the results from that for you know different analytical components or whatever by the way if you're not working as a software engineer yet but you do want to get there also feel free to check out my udemy course a 40 hour plus course where you're going to learn all of the fundamentals from python sql building an application integrating database caching linting github all this good stuff so that you're actually going to be able to have that technical skill set to start but anyway, let's get back to it. So let's get to the queries. One of the most important things that you should think about when writing queries is if you have limit statements or filters, put those down as far as you can. Filter as early as you can, take a limit as early as you can, because that means less data has to be retrieved, less data is gonna be processed and moved around, and it's really gonna be a huge bump to your performance. If you find yourself filtering for a date at the very, very end, and your table contains years of data, and that filter can't be properly pushed down by your optimization engine, then you're gonna find your queries running extremely long because it's gonna process that whole analysis on the full set of data, and at the very end, you're gonna do your filter. So if you only need a subset of data, the first thing that you should think about is how far can I push my filters down? Sometimes your query optimization is gonna do that for you, but don't really rely on this. Think about for yourself, if you can actually move this filter further down into a location where it makes sense. Because essentially, the less data you have to process and the less data you have to move around and look at, the faster things are gonna go. So always move those filters down. And the same thing goes for limit statements. If you're doing some sort of pagination or anything else where you have some sort of a limit involved, how far can you push that limit down? Because again, if you have a massive table and at the end you're selecting the first 100, 500, 1000 rows or whatever, and you have the option to paginate over that, can you push that limit all the way down into one of those initial subqueries or CTEs? Because that means you're only gonna be processing those initial or those 1000 rows or whatever your size may be at a time, rather than processing everything over and over and over and again, and then only at the end, taking the actual section that you need. So think about pushing down your limits, think about pushing down your filters, and although the query optimization engine will sometimes try to do it for you, you can't rely on it to always do it for you perfectly. And so if you find somewhere where you can do this, then you know, make sure you push it down because this is gonna be a massive boost to your performance. And on the topic of CTEs, CTEs can be really great for performance too, because if you find yourself having a subquery that you repeat in multiple places, First of all, a CT is gonna be a really nice way for you to abstract that logic and put it in one place so that you don't have things like a copy paste mistake or if you make a change in one of those subqueries and you forget to make it in another, it's gonna actually mess with your results. So obviously there's some good software practices there already just to not repeat yourself and have it all defined in one place. But actually there is an optimization component to CTEs too, which is if you use the same subquery in multiple places, it actually is gonna recompute those results but if you instead use a CTE and query the results of your CTE, then it's only gonna compute the CTE once and it's gonna reuse those results. So you're gonna spare yourself a lot of work because CTEs 
are just going to be computed once and then you can reuse those results whereas for subqueries you're going to be recomputing them every single time even if you've just copy pasted a subquery to two different places so think about not just the nice kind of software aspect and having good software practices of using CTEs, but actually think about using CTEs too because they will give you a nice boost for your performance. That being said, you should still be careful because with CTEs, you may not get the filter pushdown that is more easily done by a query optimization engine if you use a direct subquery. So this may depend on the actual you know, relational database that you're using, but Generally, you know, CTEs are going to be great if you're reusing your data, but there are going to be some consequences there for the query optimization engine because it may actually not do your pushdown for you. Obviously, like we said before, you shouldn't rely on the optimization engine too much for that. And whenever you see a place for improvements to be had, you should do that yourself just to make sure that that's actually the way it's being done, even if your optimization engine would have reached the same result, just because it's, you know, good practice and it future proofs yourself. But there are some of these um, detriments to the CTE where your query optimization engine may be a little bit more careful and not actually do some of these pushdowns for you. However, like everything, you know, think about the context that you're working in because obviously every problem is going to be slightly different and what may work in one place is not going to work in another. So always keep these tips at the top of your mind. But remember, it's all about the context and think about, is this going to make sense for me? How can I adapt some of these techniques into the problem that I have? And which one of these, if any, are going to help solve it? And sometimes it's going to be multiple. You'll find yourselves maybe using CTEs, materialized views, and also moving up your filters and your limits. And you're going to find yourself, you know, having some really nice performances from there. Or other times you're going to notice, hey, you know, I'm already doing most of this or my data is changing incredibly fast and there's not a lot that I can do. And, you know, sometimes that's the way it is. But it's important to be aware of the different techniques that you can take and think about the different angles that you can approach a problem from and how you can optimize it to essentially get less data moving around. Because if we have to move around and analyze less data, then things are going to go quicker.